Book 3, of Words, Chapter 11, of the Remedies of the Foregoing Imperfections and Abuses of Words. 1. Remedies are worth seeking. The natural and improved imperfections of languages we have seen above at large, and speech being the great bond that holds society together, and the common conduit, whereby the improvements of knowledge are conveyed from one man and one generation to another, it would well deserve our most serious thoughts to consider what remedies are to be found for the inconveniences above mentioned, too, and not easy to find. I am not so vain as to think that any one can pretend to attempt the perfect reforming the languages of the world, no not so much as of his own country, without rendering himself ridiculous. To require that men should use their words constantly in the same sense, and for none but determined and uniform ideas, would be to think that all men should have the same notions and should talk of nothing but what they have clear and distinct ideas of, which is not to be expected by any one who hath not vanity enough to imagine he can prevail with men to be very knowing or very silent. And he must be very little skilled in the world, who thinks that a voluble tongue shall accompany only a good understanding, or that men's talking much or little should hold proportion only to their knowledge. 3 but yet necessary to those who search after truth. But though the market and exchange must be left to their own ways of talking, and gossipings not be robbed of their ancient privilege, though the schools, and men of argument would perhaps take it amiss to have anything offered, to abate the length or lessen the number of their disputes, yet methinks those who pretend seriously to search after or maintain truth, should think themselves obliged to study how they might deliver themselves without obscurity doubtfulness, or equivocation, to which men's words are naturally liable, if care be not taken. 4. Misuse of words the great cause of errors. For he that shall well consider the errors and obscurity, the mistakes and confusion, that are spread in the world by an ill use of words, will find some reason to doubt whether language, as it has been employed, has contributed more to the improvement or hindrance of knowledge amongst mankind. How many are there, that, when they would think on things, fix their thoughts only on words, especially when they would apply their minds to moral matters. And who then can wonder if the result of such contemplations and reasonings, about little more than sounds, whilst the ideas they annex to them are very confused and very unsteady, or perhaps none at all, who can wonder, I say, that such thoughts and reasonings end in nothing but obscurity and mistake, without any clear judgment or knowledge. 5. Has made men more conceited and obstinate. This inconvenience, in an ill use of words, men suffer in their own private meditations, but much more manifest are the disorders which follow from it, in conversation, discourse, and arguings with others. For language being the great conduit, whereby men convey their discoveries, reasonings, and knowledge, from one to another, he that makes an ill use of it, though he does not corrupt the fountains of knowledge, which are in things themselves, yet he does, as much as in him lies, break or stop the pipes whereby it is distributed to the public use and advantage of mankind. He that uses words without any clear and steady meaning, what does he but lead himself and others into errors? And he that designedly does it, ought to be looked on as an enemy to truth and knowledge. And yet who can wonder that all the sciences and parts of knowledge have been so overcharged with obscure and equivocal terms? and insignificant and doubtful expressions, capable to make the most attentive or quick-sighted very little, or not at all, the more knowing or orthodox, since subtlety, in those who make profession to teach or defend truth, hath passed so much for a virtue, a virtue, indeed, which, consisting for the most part in nothing but the fallacious and illusory use of obscure or deceitful terms, is only fit to make men more conceited in their ignorance and more obstinate in their errors. 6. Addicted to wrangling about sounds. Let us look into the books of controversy of any kind, there we shall see that the effect of obscure, unsteady, or equivocal terms is nothing but noise and wrangling about sounds, without convincing or bettering a man's understanding. For if the idea be not agreed on, betwixt the speaker and hearer, for which the words stand, the argument is not about things but names. As often as such a word whose signification is not ascertained betwixt them, comes in use, their understandings have no other object wherein they agree, but barely the sound, the things that they think on at that time, 
as expressed by that word, being quite different. 7. Instance, bat and bird. Whether a bat be a bird or no, is not a question, whether a bat be another thing than indeed it is, or have other qualities than indeed it has, for that would be extremely absurd to doubt of. But the question is, I, either between those that acknowledged themselves to have but imperfect ideas of one or both of this sort of things, for which these names are supposed to stand. And then it is a real inquiry concerning the nature of a bird or a bat, to make their yet imperfect ideas of it more complete, by examining whether all the simple ideas to which, combined together, they both give name bird, be all to be found in a bat. But this is a question only of inquirers, not disputers, who neither affirm nor deny, but examine, or, too, it is a question between disputants, whereof the one affirms, and the other denies that a bat is a bird. And then the question is barely about the signification of one or both these words, in that they not having both the same complex ideas to which they give these two names, one holds and the other denies that these two names may be affirmed one of another. Were they agreed in the signification of these two names, it were impossible they should dispute about them. For they would presently and clearly see, were that adjusted between them, whether all the simple ideas of the more general name bird were found in the complex idea of a bat or no, and so there could be no doubt whether a bat were a bird or number. And here I desire it may be considered, and carefully examined whether the greatest part of the disputes in the world are not merely verbal, and about the signification of words, and whether, if the terms they are made in were defined, and reduced in their signification, as they must be where they signify anything, to determine collections of the simple ideas they do or should stand for, those disputes would not end of themselves, and immediately vanish. I leave it then to be considered, what the learning of disputation is and how well they are employed for the advantage of themselves or others, whose business is only the vain ostentation of sounds, I. E. Those who spend their lives in disputes and controversies, when I shall see any of those combatants strip all his terms of ambiguity and obscurity, which every one may do in the words he uses himself, I shall think him a champion for knowledge, truth, and peace, and not the slave of vain glory, ambition, or a party. 8. Remedies. To remedy the defects of speech before mentioned to some degree, and to prevent the inconveniences that follow from them, I imagine the observation of these following rules may be of use, till somebody better able shall judge it worth his while to think more maturely on this matter, and oblige the world with his thoughts on it. First remedy, to use no word without an idea annexed to it. First, a man shall take care to use no word without a signification, no name without an idea for which he makes it stand. This rule will not seem altogether needless to any one who shall take the pains to recollect how often he has met with such words as instinct, sympathy, and antipathy, etc., in the discourse of others, so made use of as he might easily conclude that those that used them had no ideas in their minds to which they applied them, but spoke them only as sounds which usually served instead of reasons on the like occasions. Not but that these words, and the like, have very proper significations in which they may be used, but there being no natural connection between any words and any ideas, these, and any other, may be learned by rote, and pronounced or it by men who have no ideas in their minds to which they have annexed them, and for which they make them stand, which is necessary they should. If men would speak intelligibly even to themselves alone. 9. Second remedy, to have distinct, determinate ideas annexed to words, especially in mixed modes. Secondly, it is not enough a man uses his words as signs of some ideas, those he annexes them to, if they be simple, must be clear and distinct, if complex, must be determinate, that is the precise collection of simple ideas settled in the mind, with that sound annexed to it as the sign of that precise determined collection, and no other. This is very necessary in names of modes, and especially moral words, which, having no settled objects in nature, from whence their ideas are taken, as from their original, are apt to be very confused. Justice is a word in every man's mouth, but most commonly with a very undetermined, loose signification, which will always be so, 
unless a man has in his mind a distinct comprehension of the component parts that complex idea consists of and if it be decompounded, must be able to resolve it still only till he at last comes to the simple ideas that make it up, and unless this be done, a man makes an use of the word, let it be justice, for example, or any other. I do not say, a man needs stand to recollect, and make this analysis at large every time the word justice comes in his way, but this at least is necessary, that he have so examined the signification of that name, and settled the idea of all its parts in his mind, that he can do it when he pleases. If any one who makes his complex idea of justice to be, such a treatment of the person or goods of another as is according to law, hath not a clear and distinct idea what law is, which makes a part of his complex idea of justice, it is plain his idea of justice itself will be confused and imperfect. This exactness will, perhaps, be judged very troublesome, and therefore most men will think they may be excused from settling the complex ideas of mixed modes so precisely in their minds. But yet I must say, till this be done, it must not be wondered, that they have a great deal of obscurity and confusion in their own minds and a great deal of wrangling in their discourse with others. 10. And distinct and conformable ideas in words that stand for substances. In the names of substances, for a right use of them, something more is required than barely determined ideas. In these the names must also be conformable to things as they exist, but of this I shall have occasion to speak more at large by and by. This exactness is absolutely necessary in inquiries after philosophical knowledge and in controversies about truth. And though it would be well, too, if it extended itself to common conversation and the ordinary affairs of life, yet I think that is scarce to be expected. Vulgar notions suit vulgar discourses, and both, though confused enough, yet serve pretty well the market and the wake. Merchants and lovers, cooks and tailors, have words wherewithal to dispatch their ordinary affairs, and so, I think, might philosophers and disputants too, if they had a mind to understand, and to clearly understood. 11. Third remedy, to apply words to such ideas as common use has annexed them to. Thirdly, it is not enough that men have ideas, determined ideas, for which they make these signs stand, but they must also take care to apply their words as near as may be to such ideas as common use has annexed them to. For words especially of languages already framed, being no man's private possession, but the common measure of commerce and communication, it is not for any one at pleasure to change the stamp they are current in, nor alter the ideas they are affixed to, or at least, when there is a necessity to do so. He is bound to give notice of it. Men's intentions in speaking are, or at least should be, to be understood, which cannot be without frequent explanations, demands, and other the like incommodious interruptions, where men do not follow common news. Propriety of speech is that which gives our thoughts entrance into other men's minds with the greatest ease and advantage, and therefore deserves some part of our care and study, especially in the names of moral words. The proper signification and use of terms is best to be learned from those who in their writings and discourses appear to have had the clearest notions and applied to them their terms with the exactest choice and fitness. This way of using a man's words, according to the propriety of the language, though it have not always the good fortune to be understood, yet most commonly leaves the blame of it on him who is so unskillful in the language he speaks, as not to understand it when made use of as it ought to be. 12. Fourth remedy, to declare the meaning in which we use them. Fourthly, but, because common use has not so visibly annexed any signification to words, as to make men know always certainly what they precisely stand for, and because men, in the improvement of their knowledge, come to have ideas different from the vulgar and ordinary received ones, for which they must either make new words, which men seldom venture to do, for fear of being thought guilty of affectation or novelty, or else must use old ones in a new signification, therefore, after the observation of the foregoing rules, it is sometimes necessary, for the ascertaining the signification of words, to declare their meaning, where either common use has left it uncertain and loose, as it is in most names of very complex ideas, or where the term, being very material in the discourse, 
and that upon which it chiefly turns, is liable to any doubtfulness or mistake. 13. And that in three ways. As the ideas men's words stand for are of different sorts, so the way of making known the ideas they stand for, when there is occasion, is also different. For though defining be thought the proper way to make known the proper signification of words, yet there are some words that will not be defined, as there are others whose precise meaning cannot be made known but by definition, and perhaps a third, which partakes somewhat of both the other, as we shall see in the names of simple ideas, modes, and substances. 14. In simple ideas, either by synonymous terms, or by showing examples. I first, when a man makes use of the name of any simple idea, which he perceives is not understood, or is in danger to be mistaken, he is obliged, by the laws of ingenuity and the end of speech, to declare his meaning, and make known what idea he makes it stand for. This, as has been shown, cannot be done by definition, and therefore, when a synonymous word fails to do it, there is but one of these ways left. First, sometimes the naming the subject wherein that simple idea is to be found will make its name to be understood by those who are acquainted with that subject, and know it by that name. So to make a countryman understand what Philomorty color signifies, it may suffice to tell him, it is the color of withered leaves falling in autumn. Secondly, but the only sure way of making known the signification of the name of any simple idea, is by presenting to his senses that subject which may produce sight tea in his mind and make him actually have the idea that word stands for. 15. In mixed modes, by definition. 2. Secondly, mixed modes, especially those belonging to morality, being most of them such combinations of ideas as the mind puts together of its own choice, and whereof there are not always standing patterns to be found existing, the signification of their names cannot be made known, as those of simple ideas, by any showing, but, in recompense thereof, may be perfectly and exactly defined, for they being combinations of several ideas that the mind of man has arbitrarily put together, without reference to any archetypes, men may, if they please, exactly know the ideas that go to each composition, and so both use these words in a certain and undoubted signification, and perfectly declare, when there is occasion, what they stand for. This, if well considered would lay great blame on those who make not their discourses about moral things very clear and distinct. For since the precise signification of the names of mixed modes, or, which is all one, the real essence of each species is to be known, they being not of nature's, but man's making, it is a great negligence and perverseness to discourse of moral things with uncertainty and obscurity, which is more pardonable in treating of natural substances where doubtful terms are hardly to be avoided, for a quite contrary reason, as we shall see by and by. 16. Morality capable of demonstration. Upon this ground it is that I am bold to think that morality is capable of demonstration, as well as mathematics, since the precise real essence of the things moral words stand for may be perfectly known, and so the congruity and incongruity of the things themselves be certainly discovered in which consists perfect knowledge. Nor let any one object, that the names of substances are often to be made use of and morality, as well as those of modes, from which will arise obscurity. For, as to substances, when concerned in moral discourses, their divers natures are not so much inquired into as supposed, v.g. when we say that man is subject to law, we mean nothing by man but a corporeal rational creature what the real essence or other qualities of that creature are in this case is no way considered. And, therefore, whether a child or changeling be a man, in a physical sense, may amongst the naturalists be as disputable as it will, it concerns not at all the moral man, as I may call him, which is this immovable, unchangeable idea, a corporeal rational being. For, whether a monkey, or any other creature, to be found that had the use of reason to such a degree, as to be able to understand general signs, and to deduce consequences about general ideas. He would no doubt be subject to law, and in that sense be a man, how much soever he differed in shape from others of that name. The names of substances, if they be used in them as they should, can no more disturb moral than they do mathematical discourses, where, if the mathematician speaks of a cube or globe of gold, 
or of any other body, he has his clear, settled idea, which varies not, though it may by mistake be applied to a particular body to which it belongs not. 17. Definitions can make moral discourse clear. This I have here mentioned, by the by, to show of what consequence it is for men, in their names of mixed modes, and consequently in all their moral discourses, to define their words when there is occasion, since thereby moral knowledge may be brought to so great clearness and certainty. And it must be great want of ingenuousness, to say no worse of it, to refuse to do it, since a definition is the only way whereby the precise meaning of moral words can be known, and yet a way whereby their meaning may be known certainly and without leaving any room for any contest about it. And therefore the negligence or perverseness of mankind cannot be excused, if their discourses in morality be not much more clear than those in natural philosophy, since they are about ideas in the mind, which are none of them false or disproportionate, they having no external beings for the archetypes which they are referred to and must correspond with. It is far easier for men to frame in their minds an idea which shall be the standard to which they will give the name justice, with which pattern so made, all actions that agree shall pass under the denomination, then, having seen Aristides, to frame an idea that shall in all things be exactly like him, who is as he is, let men make what idea they please of him. For the one, they need but know the combination of ideas that are put together in their own minds, for the other, they must inquire into the whole nature, an abstruse hidden constitution and various qualities of a thing existing without them. 18. And is the only way in which the meaning of mixed modes can be made known. Another reason that makes the defining of mixed modes so necessary, especially of moral words, is what I mentioned a little before, viz. that it is the only way whereby the signification of the most of them can be known with certainty, for the ideas they stand for, being for the most part such whose component parts nowhere exist together but scattered and mingled with others, it is the mind alone that collects them, and gives them the union of one idea, and it is only by words enumerating the several simple ideas which the mind has united, that we can make known to others what their names stand for, the assistance of the senses in this case not helping us, by the proposal of sensible objects, to show the ideas which our names of this kind stand for, as it does often in the names of sensible simple ideas and also to some degree in those of substances. 19. In substances, both by showing and by defining. 3. Thirdly, for the explaining the signification of the names of substances, as they stand for the ideas we have of their distinct species, both aforementioned ways, viz. of showing and defining, are requisite, in many cases, to be made use of. 4. The being ordinarily in each sort some leading qualities, to which we suppose the other ideas which make up our complex idea of that species annexed. We forwardly give the specific name to that thing wherein that characteristic mark is found, which we take to be the most distinguishing idea of that species. These leading or characteristical, as I may call them, ideas, in the sorts of animals and vegetables, are, as has been before remarked, ch vi, section 29 and ch. 9. Section 15. Mostly figure, and in inanimate bodies, color, and in some, both together. Now, 20. Ideas of the leading qualities of substances are best got by showing. These leading sensible qualities are those which make the chief ingredients of our specific ideas, and consequently the most observable and invariable part in the definitions of our specific names as attributed to sorts of substances coming under our knowledge, for though the sound man, in its own nature, be as apt to signify a complex idea made up of animality and rationality, united in the same subject, as to signify any other combination, yet, used as a mark to stand for a sort of creatures we count of our own kind, perhaps the outward shape is as necessary to be taken into our complex idea, signified by the word man as any other we find in it, and therefore, why Plato's animal implume by Pslatus and Gybus should not be a good definition of the name man, standing for that sort of creatures, will not be easy to show, for it is the shape, as the leading quality, that seems more to determine that species, than a faculty of reasoning, which appears not at first, and in some never. And if this be not allowed to be so, 
I do not know how they can be excused from murder who kill monstrous births, as we call them, because of an unordinary shape, without knowing whether they have a rational soul or no, which can be no more discerned in a well-formed than ill-shaped infant, as soon as born. And who is it has informed us that a rational soul can inhabit no tenement, unless it is just such a sort of frontispiece, or can join itself to, and inform no sort of body but one that is just of such an outward structure 21 and can hardly be made known otherwise. Now these leading qualities are best made known by showing, and can hardly be made known otherwise. For the shape of a horse or cassowary will be but truly and imperfectly imprinted on the mind by words, the sight of the animals doth it a thousand times better. And the idea of the particular color of gold is not to be got by any description of it but only by the frequent exercise of the eyes about as is evident in those who are used to this metal, who frequently distinguish true from counterfeit, pure from adulterate, by the sight, where others, who have as good eyes, but yet by use have not got the precise nice idea of that peculiar yellow, shall not perceive any difference. The like may be said of those other simple ideas, peculiar in their kind to any substance, for which precise ideas there are no peculiar names. The particular ringing sound there is in gold, distinct from the sound of other bodies, has no particular name annexed to it, no more than the particular yellow that belongs to that metal. 22. The ideas of the powers of substances are best known by definition. But because many of the simple ideas that make up our specific ideas of substances are powers which lie not obvious to our senses in the things as they ordinarily appear, therefore, in the signification of our names of substances, some part of the signification will be better made known by enumerating those simple ideas, than by showing the substance itself. For, he that to the yellow shining color of gold, got by sight, shall, from my enumerating them, have the ideas of great ductility, fusibility, fixedness, and solubility, in aqua regia, will have a perfecter idea of gold than he can have by seeing a piece of gold and thereby imprinting in his mind only its obvious qualities. But if the formal constitution of this shining, heavy, ductile thing, from whence all these its properties flow, lay open to our senses, as the formal constitution or essence of a triangle does, the signification of the word gold might as easily be ascertained as that of triangle. 23. A reflection on the knowledge of corporeal things possessed by spirits separate from bodies. Hence we may take notice how much the foundation of all our knowledge of corporeal things lies in our senses. For how spirits, separate from bodies, whose knowledge and ideas of these things are certainly much more perfect than ours, know them, we have no notion, no idea at all. The whole extent of our knowledge or imagination reaches not beyond our own ideas limited to our ways of perception. Though yet it be not to be doubted that spirits of a higher rank than those immersed in flesh may have as clear ideas of the radical constitution of substances as we have of a triangle, and so perceive how all their properties and operations flow from thence but the manner how they come by that knowledge exceeds our conceptions. 24. Ideas of substances must also be conformable to things. Fourthly, but, though definitions will serve to explain the names of substances as they stand for our ideas, yet they leave them not without great imperfection as they stand for things. For our names of substances being not put barely for our ideas, but being made use of ultimately to represent things, and so are put in their place their signification must agree with the truth of things as well as with men's ideas. And therefore, in substances, we are not always to rest in the ordinary complex idea commonly received as the signification of that word, but must go a little further, and inquire into the nature and properties of the things themselves, and thereby perfect, as much as we can, our ideas of their distinct species, or else learn them from such as are used to that sort of things and are experienced in them. For, since it is intended their names should stand for such collections of simple ideas as do really exist in things themselves, as well as for the complex idea in other men's minds, which in their ordinary acceptation they stand for, therefore, to define their names right, natural history is to be inquired into, and their properties are, with care and examination, to be found out. For it is not enough 
for the avoiding inconveniences in discourse and arguings about natural bodies and substantial things, to have learned, from the propriety of the language, the common, but confused, or very imperfect, idea to which each word is applied, and to keep them to that idea in our use of them, but we must, by acquainting ourselves with the history of that sort of things, rectify and settle our complex idea belonging to each specific name, and in discourse with others, if we find them mistake us, we ought to tell what the complex idea is that we make such a name stand for. This is the more necessary to be done by all those who search after knowledge and philosophical verity, in that children, being taught words, whilst they have but imperfect notions of things, apply them at random, and without much thinking, and seldom frame determined ideas to be signified by them, which custom, it being easy, and serving well enough for the ordinary affairs of life and conversation, they are apt to continue when they are men, and so begin at the wrong end, learning words first and perfectly, but make the notions to which they apply those words afterwards very overtly. By this means it comes to pass, that men speaking the language of their country, that is according to grammar rules of that language, do yet speak very improperly of things themselves, and, by their arguing one with another, make but small progress in the discoveries of useful truths, and the knowledge of things, as they are to be found in themselves, and not in our imaginations, and it matters not much for the improvement of our knowledge how they are called. 25. Not easy to be made so. It were therefore to be wished, that men versed in physical inquiries, and acquainted with the several sorts of natural bodies, would set down those simple ideas wherein they observe the individuals of each sort constantly to agree. This would remedy a great deal of that confusion which comes from several persons applying the same name to a collection of a smaller or greater number of sensible qualities, proportionably as they have been more or less acquainted with, or accurate in examining, the qualities of any sort of things which come under one denomination, but a dictionary of this sort, containing, as it were, a natural history, requires too many hands as well as too much time, cost, pains, and sagacity ever to be hoped for, and till that be done, we must content ourselves with such definitions of the names of substances as explain the sense men use them in. And it would be well, where there is occasion, if they would afford us so much. This yet is not usually done, but men talk to one another, and dispute in words, whose meaning is not agreed between them out of a mistake that the significations of common words are certainly established, and the precise ideas they stand for perfectly known, and that it is a shame to be ignorant of them. Both which suppositions are false, no names of complex ideas having so settled determined significations, that they are constantly used for the same precise ideas. Nor is it a shame for a man to have a certain knowledge of anything, but by the necessary ways of attaining it and so it is no discredit not to know what precise idea any sound stands for in another man's mind, without he declare it to me by some other way than barely using that sound, there being no other way, without such a declaration, certainly to know it. Indeed the necessity of communication by language brings men to an agreement in the signification of common words, within some tolerable latitude, that may serve for ordinary conversation and so a man cannot be supposed wholly ignorant of the ideas which are annexed to words by common use, in a language familiar to him, but common use being but a very uncertain rule, which reduces itself at last to the ideas of particular men, proves often but a very variable standard. But though such a dictionary as I have above mentioned will require too much time, cost, and pains to be hoped for in this age, yet methinks it is not unreasonable to propose that words standing for things which are known and distinguished by their outward shapes should be expressed by little drafts and prints made of them. A vocabulary made after this fashion would perhaps with more ease, and in less time, teach the true signification of many terms, especially in languages of remote countries or ages, and settle truer ideas in men's minds of several things, whereof we read the names in ancient authors than all the large and laborious comments of learned critics, naturalists, that treat of plants and animals, have found the benefit of this way, and he that has had occasion to consult them will have reason to confess that he has a clearer idea of apium or ibex, from a little print of that herb or beast, 
than he could have from a long definition of the names of either of them. And so no doubt he would have of Strigil and Sistrum, if, instead of curry comb and symbol, which are the English names dictionaries render them by, he could see stamped in the margin small pictures of these instruments, as they were in use amongst the ancients. Toga, tunica, pallium, are words easily translated by gown, coat, and cloak, but we have thereby no more true ideas of the fashion of those habits amongst the Romans, than we have of the faces of the tailors who made them. Such things as these, which the eye distinguishes by their shapes, would be best let into the mind by draughts made of them, and more determine the signification of such words, than any other words set for them, or made use of to define them. But this is only by the by. 26. V. Fifth remedy, to use the same word constantly in the same sense. Fifthly, if men will not be at the pains to declare the meaning of their words, and definitions of their terms are not to be had, yet this is the least that can be expected, that, in all discourses wherein one man pretends to instruct or convince another, he should use the same word constantly in the same sense. If this were done, which nobody can refuse without great disingenuity, many of the books extant might be spared, many of the controversies in dispute would be at an end, several of those great volumes, swollen with ambiguous words, now used in one sense, and by and by in another, would shrink into a very narrow compass, and many of the philosophers, to mention no other, as well as poets' works, might be contained in a nutshell. 27. When not so used, the variation is to be explained. But after all, the provision of words is so scanty in respect to that infinite variety of thoughts, that men, wanting terms to suit their precise notions, will, notwithstanding their utmost caution, be forced often to use the same word in somewhat different senses. And though in the continuation of a discourse, or the pursuit of an argument, there can be hardly room to digress into a particular definition, as often as a man varies the signification of any term, yet the import of the discourse will, for the most part, if there be no designed fallacy, sufficiently lead candid and intelligent readers into the true meaning of it. But where there is not sufficient to guide the reader, there it concerns the writer to explain his meaning, and show in what sense he the uses that term.